This month's Where Did the Road Go is brought to you by Super Inframan and Allison Cook, two really awesome people that help keep this show going, as do all of my patrons. If you want to become a patron, www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? And tonight I have back with me Mr. Steve Stockton. Hey, Steve. Hey, Soraya. How you doing? I had uh, originally planned on having you back sooner after your last book because you had two of them out by the time I had you on the last time. Uh, but that, yeah. that didn't happen. But you're here now. Yeah, glad to be here. And I'm actually in that particular series. I've got a third one out. So Yes, yes. And we got to get to that one, too, before you release six more books. <laughs> You're going to catch up with Nick Redfern. Oh, man, I'm telling you. I think the guy writes uh, two books at a time, one with each hand. <laughs> it's very possible. I'd, I'd love to be prolific. Um, I'm going to be at the Dogman slash Cryptid Conference in Paris, Tennessee on August 13th. Nick Redfern's going to be there. Him, David Weatherly, uh, Ken Gerhardt, a lot of the, the heavy hitters in the Dogman and Cryptid community. Nice. Josh Turner. Really looking forward to that. Yeah, I bet. And that's when? Uh, August the 13th in Paris, Tennessee. Hmm. And that's a, just a little place. It's kind of sort of halfway between Nashville and Memphis, but up close to the Kentucky border. And the reason that they picked that area, that's uh, near the land between the lakes where they've had a lot of dogman sightings. What do you make of dogman sightings? You know, I'm not really sure. I haven't studied a lot about that one. To me, I see the roots of it in the, uh, the uh, early European werewolf lore, but it's a totally different story. It's not a human that's cursed or that changes into a dog instead of a wolf, but it's there's some similarities. But uh, if, it, if it exists, I think it's some kind of shapeshifter, mm. skinwalker, something like that, you know, that, that can take on any form, and that's the form that it likes to take on as a upright uh, bipedal dog. Yeah, because you got some of them wearing clothes and, and like, uh, wasn't there one with the, where they were smoking cigarettes or something? Yeah. And uh, talked to a lady in, um, I think she's in Louisiana, Mississippi. Louisiana, I think. She had encountered one, and it looked like uh, an Egyptian Anubis, the head of it did. Oh. What, that's that's the first one of those that I've heard of. But, yeah, there's, there's some strange things going on out there, and I... I don't know if it's just coming more to the fore, and that's why there's so much talk and interest in it now. If they've been there all along, and people are just now finding out about it, or or, or just it's, interpreted it's it as something else. Yeah, and I uh, heard an interesting story the other night on um, can't remember what podcast I was listening to, or uh, might have been a live stream. And at some national park, they had found a bear in its den with its head ripped off. I mean, not not cut off or bit off or chewed off. It had been ripped off. Oh. And uh, there were some large canine-looking prints around there, and they think it was uh, maybe a dog, ma'am. That was on uh, What Lurks Beneath. That's uh, hmm. Josh, um, I can't remember his last name, but YouTube channel. He's going to be at uh, the conference, too. Hmm. And that It seems like it would be hard to prove what it was without, you know, another example to go by, you know what I mean? Yeah. But anything that's big enough and mean enough to rip the head off a bear, I, I don't want to mess with it. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're, the book we're talking about now is National Park Mysteries and Disappearances, Volume 2, California, mm -hmm. Yosemite, Joshua Tree, and Mount Shasta. Yeah, there, there's actually, I could probably do two or three more volumes just on California because there's so much stuff there, so many weird things. Uh, disappearances, unsolved murders, just weird in general. Yeah. But uh, th those are my favorite three, and I've had uh, personal experiences in two of those places, Joshua Tree and Mount Shasta. And uh, Yosemite, is uh, it has the distinction or the, the dubious distinction 
of having the most missing people of any national park, even though it's only the second most visited national park. Uh, Great Smokies in Tennessee uh, more than doubles the number of visitors, but uh, Yosemite's a, a close second. Is there any reason Yosemite would would have that from like uh, like dangerous trails or anything? Yeah, it's it's wild, rough, rugged country, and just I think anytime you have that many people going into a place like that, they're, they're more likely for things to happen to them. I mean, just the, the odds of something happening go up. Um, and I, th- I think it's just it is just the, the terrain and, and the the way it is there. It's easy to get lost. It's easy to fall. There's Everything there from gentle day hikes to, you know, technical rock climbing and, and ascending and that sort of thing. So for people who aren't familiar, where is Yosemite located? Okay, it's kind of in the middle of California. It's not Southern California, but it's not Northern California. It's about equals with San Francisco, but farther over uh, toward the eastern side of the state, getting close to the Nevada border. And then north and south of there, you've got a lot of national forests. You've got El Dorado. You've got, uh, you're not too far from Death Valley. So it's a, a strange area there with a lot of, uh, a lot of rocks and trees and lakes and water and, uh, there's a, a million ways to die in the forest if you're not careful. Right. Yeah. Um, and how many people, do you know how many people do go missing a year there? Uh, well, that's one of the things, you know, they don't keep records on that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So it uh, affects tourism. But, um, let's see if I can get, uh, there, there are currently 13 missing right now, looks like, okay. that, that haven't been found. But uh, just in the national park system in general, it's estimated that there's like 6,000 a year that go missing. And then if you look nationwide at all the missing people, it's it's in the tens of thousands. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a crazy a number. And I don't of course, think you- a lot of those are found. A lot of those are runaways. A lot yeah. of those are people that wanted to disappear. But or, there's just or who there's a been, crazy amount. Or who have been kidnapped or trafficked. Mm-hmm. A, lot of, a lot of that goes on. Um one of the books working on now, one of the next ones is uh, Spirited Away about the missing, murdered indigenous. Yeah. And uh, see that a lot, particularly up in the Great Lakes area and then in Canada along what they call the Highway of Tears. Yeah. Um, there's people just, they don't have a lot of resources. And in particular, teenage girls that want to go somewhere, they'll hitchhike. And that's just, you know, that's a recipe for disaster. They even have signs up warning uh, ladies not to hitchhike and, and men too for that matter men go missing but it seems to be more prevalent among indigenous women yeah that's that's a really horrible situation and you don't hear a lot about it that no. was one of the reasons we decided to cover it. we've been doing a video series on my YouTube missing persons and mysteries I thought you know there, there's a book here too there's some stuff you can't talk about on YouTube or you can't go into certain grisly details and stuff that a lot of these cases have. So, uh, the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say, will be in the book. <laughs> uh, Paul Harvey. Wow. <laughs> Blast haven't, heard, the past, uh, haven't heard that name of forever. Huh. Um, so uh, one, one of the interesting th- things when you're talking about Yosemite, one of the first things you talk about are these freak lightning storms that tend to, to show up there. Yeah. And that's, I don't know if it's because of the, um, just the geological makeup of the place, but uh, well, that's what I would think that there has to be something in the ground that's attracting lightning. Yeah, uh, yeah just uh, I know of at least five times that, that things have happened there, and, and then once on top of the the renowned Half Dome, which is the big uh, peak there, uh, five uh, lightning hit five hikers, killed two of them, and injured the other three, and uh, they were sitting on top of a cavern when uh, the lightning struck, and uh, the National Park Service kind of uses that now as a cautionary tale uh, to, our, to visitors to to make them aware of uh, just how deadly those lightning strikes can be. And, you know, when you're on a pretty much bald rock like that, you are the tallest thing around, and typically yeah. lightning will strike the, the tallest thing it can get to, and if that happens to be you, then... That's what you get. Yeah, and that's not something you want. I've seen I've seen people who have survived lightning strikes, and they have all the black, uh, basically like black lightning marks that have gone through their body. And I've seen people be like, "Oh, I want to get struck by lightning, so I look like that." And it's like, <laughs> no, no, you don't. 
Yeah, I wouldn't want to risk it. I've been been close, but uh, never close that I almost got struck. Uh, there used to be a guy that I read about in, uh, I think one of those, are like the Time Life uh, paranormal books or whatever. He was a park ranger, and he'd been struck by lightning, something incredible, like seven times. Yes, yes, I remember that. And, uh, he ended up taking his own life. I don't know if what that was all about, but strange thing. I remember him holding his uh, ranger hat up, and it had a big scorch mark and a hole in it where lightning had hit him in the top of the head. And you got to wonder what, what it was about him that, A, attracted the lightning, and B, left him m- relatively unscarred from it. So. Yeah. The, he, he was kind of cryptic about that. He said that uh, it had been revealed to him what it was all about, but he, he didn't want to share it. So Of course. You know, I, <laughs> hmm. Um, so let, let, let's talk about some of the, the missing people there. Like, uh, let's uh, go into the story of Emerson Holt. You know, uh, Emerson Holt, uh, he was, um, now this is back in the, the 40s, 1943. He was the vice president of the Riverside Title Company. And he and uh, 20 members, 20 other members of the Los Angeles Division of the Sierra Club uh, were at a place up there called Camp Curry. And um, they just decided to venture off on a, a 13-mile hike. And that was the last time he was ever seen. They put a search party together to look for him. And then, uh, I mean, this was somebody, he was an outdoor enthusiast. That he was a little older gentleman, I think. But he had spent plenty of time in the outdoor. I mean, that's Sierra Club. That's that's what they, they do or did. Um, and as far as uh, cause of death, uh, foul play, suspected suicide, any of those things that normally you, you put there, they don't. You know, there's no indications for anything like that. He just was there and then he wasn't. And that's, that's the strange thing about so many of these disappearances. It's, and it's usually somebody that is well-versed in the woods. I mean, you could understand if, um, people that, that weren't very well known or weren't with the, were, excuse me, weren't very well acquainted with the outdoors getting lost, but this people that, uh, regularly hiked and, uh, did things in Yosemite and just disappeared. And uh, we've got a quote here. Uh, Park Superintendent Frank Kittredge said the others became alarmed when Holt failed to rejoin them. And that was the thing. He split off on his own. That happens in a lot of these cases. Sometimes even just for a brief time, somebody will go back to the car, go back to the campsite to get something. And then they never show back up. Hmm. But uh, uh, others became alarmed when Holt failed to rejoin them. And the search has begun at once. Kittredge said he and other park officials are puzzled. Because the fact that the Merced River, at the point where Holt rested, is shallow and not swift, there's no cliffs or deep pools within several hundred yards. And yeah, that was Saturday, July 24th, 1943, and nothing was ever found, remains missing to this day. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes when you look up some of these old cases, you find out, oh, they found them, but, it, you know, they found it like 30 years later, and it just wasn't a big news item. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's something we do is go back, and uh, so there's a lot of these historical cases where they did find remains, and they did, uh, some cases, people are even found alive years later. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I love going back and finding those where it's just kind of in the the hive mind, you know, that this person was missing and then find out. Okay, they're not, or they're they're part of them were found. Uh, we covered a case recently about Bobby Bizzup, a little deaf boy that went missing at a, a camp uh, for kids. It was um, sponsored by the Catholic Church, and uh, the story was that he went into the woods, and uh, I think he was uh, one of the counselors had gone and told him that it was time for dinner. He needed to go back to the, the mess hall. And then never saw him again when he was leaving from where he was at the lake to the the lodge. And uh, then it turns out, decades later, one of the uh, counselors that had worked there had found his remains. And uh, somehow the skull ended up in the hands of a doctor who kept it on his desk. And then when he died, he left it to his son. And he had told his son shortly before he died... Um, in my study, in my desk, in a paper bag, there's a skull that may belong to Bobby Bizzup. Huh. And, and they've since turned it back over to the, uh, the FBI for DNA testing and stuff. But that's, you know, this. Why wouldn't he turn it over sooner if he thought that's who it was? Well, apparently there was a cover up. There was some. Uh, oh. The, uh, the priests that were in charge of the camp were 
later uh, convicted sex offenders. Uh, of course. So, yeah, kind of. It, it doesn't seem as mysterious once you, you get all the facts together there. and Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's those, th- those those types are really sad. Some of those you almost wish it would remain a mystery because the truth, there's nothing mysterious about it. But that just, you know, that really hurts to to know that some little kids suffered like that. Yeah, absolutely. The um, we also found like like we did a show uh, back in I think January uh, where we t- someone on Reddit had looked at a lot of uh, old missing four one one cases and found that a lot of them have solutions which initially kind of looked you know i was kind of like whoa did dave leave all this stuff out but uh as one of the snake brothers pointed out a lot of this stuff wasn't digitized till recently yeah so when you're looking at these old cases you you have a very limited i mean you can go look through micro you know microfilm and stuff like that at libraries but until recently this stuff wasn't like google searchable and now now you can just pop a name into Google and you may come up with a, a newspaper article that was recently digitized that, you know, says, oh, this person was found. And, yeah. you know, it's like there, there's just so much info out there. The newer cases, of course, that's different because, yeah, everything's digital now. It's so all it's, out there. Yeah. Uh, for the channel, we use uh, newspapers.com. Yeah. And they're constantly adding to that library and scanning stuff. And what I love to do is go in there and um, – look for cryptid reports, say, prior to 1940. And right. you get some wild stuff there, like in the, the, the 30s, 20s, the early 1900s. Yep. And, you know, they don't really call it Bigfoot or anything. It's usually a, a wild man or a gorilla an ape man or something like that yep. that ran out of the woods and attacked a stagecoach and then ran back into the woods. There was one in, uh, in the Bennington Triangle area. The stagecoach had gotten stuck in the mud. And while the driver is trying to get the, the coach unstuck, uh, a hairy man uh, ran out of the woods, uh, peered into the uh, stagecoach, turned it over, screamed, and then ran back into the woods. So you know that's anything that's strong enough to turn a stagecoach over. That's yeah, sounds sounds like Sasquatch or Bigfoot or whatever, but it's fascinating nonetheless. I don't know why that one stuck in my head, but I love that story, particularly the part about it looking inside at the people and then screaming before yes. it ran away. Yeah, no, that's awesome. <laughs> the uh, Tim Renner did a whole bunch of those for the uh, Pennsylvania area, and that's what, and that's what he said. You, it, it's not Sasquatch or Bigfoot until, what, the 50s or so. Yeah. Uh, so you have to look up Wild Man. You have to look up Gorilla. Uh, you know, anything like that, ape man, things like that. A lot of it was explained by escaped gorillas, which apparently there were lots of, except <laughs> there really weren't, you know? Yeah. He said it would, yeah, it, per- the, it would get the explanation that, you know, oh, well, a, a circus train must have crashed or yeah, something. I was going to say the, the circus train story. I've heard that one so many times. And, and of course, somewhere it probably did happen and there were wild animals running loose. Sure. But- I don't think it happened very often. And there's no newspaper reports of any circus trains, you know, crashing, which would also be in there. So the only thing I know of similar to that over in uh, middle Tennessee on the Cumberland plateau, there's a place where there are wild chickens that live in the woods, feral chickens. Really? And what happened? There was a, a truck full of live chickens that was going to, I guess the slaughterhouse. And this was in the days before the interstate highway 27, uh, it crashed uh, into the woods, and the majority of the chickens, the ones that weren't killed, escaped, and they just took over in the woods. And it's kind of like you know you hear about the wild ponies over in the Outer Banks. Well, you got the wild chickens over there in, in that area. He said Fentress County or Scott County. So, huh. <laughs> so things do happen, and things can end up places where they're not supposed to be. But yeah, those chickens have been there for for decades. Wow. I didn't know that. That's really interesting. <laughs> are they? Are they? Do they attack people? I mean, mm, not that I know of. Oh, okay. I'd say they have to be pretty stealthy. Yeah, because there's you know larger birds, predators. I have chickens here, and uh, I get hawks and things all the time trying to to get my chicken coop out back. So uh, they they have to be really wily chickens and and stay hid. Now that area does have a lot of bluffs and caves. And things like that. So there, there's plenty for them to eat. There's fresh water. And as long as they found a place to shelter, there'll be uh, chickens from, from now on. Oh, I also, I also wanted to know, uh, you had a, a chapter here on Yosemite legends. So what are some of the, uh, the, the Native American legends that go along with Yosemite? 
Um, one of the most interesting legends I found was uh, the fish women, and that's a, a Miwok folk tale. Uh, there was uh, the Awanichi, which is uh, the tribe there. They're still a young nation at the time. And uh, the Merced River was the home of the fish women, or as we know, the mermaids. Uh, they were beautiful creatures, like described in the mythology. You know, they had the tails of fish, complete with scales and fins, and the upper bodies of women. Uh, they were able to leave the water and would often sit on the rocks in the shallows, combing their long black hair and uh, singing alluring songs to the uh, the native braves there. And uh, even though they were, were charming and everything, their whole thing was to lure people into the water. Then they would take them underneath the water and uh, drown them. And uh happened on, on more than one occasion. So apparently they uh, they fished with nets and uh, the uh, they blamed the mermaids, the fish women, for uh, tangling the nets. And there were a lot of instances where somebody had to dive in to untangle the nets that uh, never came back. Or if they did find them later, they were dead. Yeah. The um, you also talk about a, uh, about uh, an evil spirit at the waterfall that lifts people up. And I remember in one of the missing four one one books, there's a woman who gets thrown a distance away from a waterfall. Like she didn't fall; it's like she was thrown off the top of it. Yeah, now, that's another Miwok legend. That's uh, Pahono. That's uh, Bridalville Falls. There, it's supposedly haunted by an ancient evil spirit that manifests in the form of an alluring and captivating wind. And uh, yeah, you know, typical. Almost, you know, a native legend there, an older woman and a maiden were picking berries. And, and that happens a lot of times in these disappearances and stuff, a lot of times in a berry patch or near berry bushes and things like that. Um, they're above Bridalville Falls. And while they were looking for these berries, uh, they saw a, a strange multicolored mist swirling in the air above the waterfall and it the old woman kind of knew what it was and knew to, to stay away from it and not look at it but the younger girl was charmed by it and uh, ended up getting to the edge of the falls and it it took her up and into the falls so hmm. makes you wonder you know what what would even be the basis of that even as a folk tale or something and i know a lot of these indigenous legends are um Cautionary tales, you know, to, to keep the kids quiet and keep them close to the to home. But um, well, the spirit of the evil wind is I'm, I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce the, the native word for it. But <laughs> right, and you know, I've, I've heard of that in other places where there are winds that will mess with you. The Superstition Mountains in Arizona is another one. Uh, very similar landscape in a lot of ways to uh, stuff you might find in Yosemite, and I've. I've there they found headless bodies, uh, heads with no bodies that didn't match the bodies that were found with no head. Really? Uh, of course, there's lost gold mines there. There's curses, uh, clouds that appear out of nowhere, rocks that uh, can't seem to be photographed. And I've heard stories of uh, wind that would come up just out of nowhere. And it was usually when somebody was inching along a cliff face or on the edge of a precipice or something could be calm all day and they get to somewhere where the wind could affect them and then suddenly these strong winds kick up out of nowhere so i th I think there are things out there spirits or mother nature whatever you want to call it that uh look out after certain places and if you're in there up to no good or maybe um taking from the land something that's not yours in the first place it kind of messes with you kind of you know shies you away a little bit and, and where was that that was in uh, the Superstition Mountains in Arizona. Okay. All right. I'm sorry, I'm all over the place here. Just no, that's all one right. One thing reminds me of another and another and another, because there's similar tales in a lot of different places. Yeah, which is also interesting when you, when you think about it, because it's, you know, it, it implies this stuff is actually happening. Yeah. And the interesting thing about a lot of these Native American legends, you'll hear the same stories from different tribes that didn't have anything to do with one another, you know, oh, yeah. centuries ago. Yeah. And yet they have some of the same stories. And, you know, you can say, well, after the Indian Removal Act and when they, they started moving everybody west, uh, Trail of Tears and all that, they maybe swapped tales. But a lot of it predates that even. Like, uh, they're the Smokies. They have tales of the the little people. They have tales of a hairy creature like a Bigfoot. Same up in New England, the Adirondacks and um 
yeah. uh, that area. They've got uh, the Pukwudgies and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. things like that. So you hear a lot of the same stories from tribes that didn't even trade with one another. Well, that's the thing. I mean, stories of little people are universal. So, I mean, like like a lot of this stuff, you know, you it may not be fairies. It may not be Bigfoot. But these stories, there's something there that's generating these stories. And you can't just throw that away because it's not exactly what people think that it might be. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, Yeah. Oh. Well, it's like the Crybaby Bridge stories. Uh, particularly down south, any little town community you go into, it's going to have at least, at least one Crybaby Bridge. And I'm thinking, well, there was either a lot of women that went crazy and flung their baby off a bridge, or it happened somewhere and the tale got passed around. And instead of telling it where they heard where it happened, they substituted a local place that maybe the person they were telling it to would know of. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I think there is a nugget of truth in there. I'm sure it's happened at least on one occasion. But yeah, in, like in Texas, there's crybaby bridges all over Texas, Tennessee, in every little community. There's there's a crybaby bridge. There's a, a woman in white that, that walks on the side of the road, which is kind of the same tale. Uh, vanishing hitchhiker those tales are common i've right, heard the same right. one told at the roaring fork motor trail in the smokies that you hear about in uh, bachelor grove cemetery in chicago yeah yeah it's sort of the the urban le but that's sort of the modern urban legend thing where mm -hmm. it kind of moves around which which makes sense because it's all the same culture mm -hmm. but what i'm saying is like every culture on, on the planet every native culture has these tales of bigfoot creatures has these tales of little people and it may not be exactly what they're interpreting it as, but you can't say there's not a phenomena there because right. obviously they're describing something and that thing and is it, similar. In particular, with Bigfoot and the little people and UFOs to degree, yeah. there's, there's similar stories throughout the world. When I was in Southeast Asia for a year, I heard a lot of stories over there that were, were very much like what you hear here, but just changed around you know, the, the locale, maybe the name or some of the circumstances. In the Philippines, they have a, a creature called an aswang, which is uh, kind of like our vampire, but um, it separates uh, at the waist. The top half That's flies right. around, and it doesn't bite people with fangs. Instead, it has a sharpened tongue that it uh, sucks blood out with, and then it's got to go back and rejoin the bottom half before daylight or it dies, and the only way to kill it is to find the lower half in the woods, pour salt in it so it can't join back together, and then that kills it. Hmm. Yeah, I have heard <laughs> that one before. That's, that's Yeah, and, and but a lot of the elements are there that you hear in other stories around the world. Yeah, it, it flies, it can change or shapeshift, it drinks blood with its mouth. Yeah. And, and it's got to be home before uh, daybreak. Right. So, I mean, some of it's probably our collective unconscious, but I mean, some of the stuff, like I said, like big, in, in UFOs, another one, you know, there, there's been reports of UFOs throughout history. We just mm -hmm. see it as different things because it's different cultures. Yeah. We were talking about that earlier, like in those stories of the Fae, where they encountered little men in a horseless carriage that came out of the sky. Right. Well, to them, that's what it was. It was, you know, a horseless carriage, but... To us hearing that in a modern context, oh, well, that was a UFO encounter, which right. I believe it was. <laughs> um, so let's, let's talk about Joshua Tree. So tell people a little bit about Joshua Tree. Oh, that's just, it's a strange place. Um, there's some kind of weird energy there. There's certain places where you can just feel it. Joshua Tree is one of those. Mount Shasta is another, which is also in this book. Uh, mentioned uh, Superstition Mount, Sedona, Arizona is that way. Uh, one I can't remember the gentleman's name, but one of the founding members of the Eagles, the rock band, uh, was quoted as saying, Joshua Tree is everybody's power spot. And it was uh, not uncommon, particularly back in the, the late 60s and early 70s, for a lot of uh, rock and roll types in L.A. to go out to Joshua Tree and uh, ingest substances and watch for UFOs. But uh, it's just it's one of those weird places in a lot of people go missing there. Uh, Graham Parsons, I talk about that story in my book. Uh, he died uh, overdosed at the Joshua Tree Inn. And uh, he'd had a pact with his road manager that whichever one of them died first would give the other a Viking funeral. So uh, his road manager uh, was true to his word when it took Graham's body off the tarmac at LAX with a borrowed hearse 
<laughs> drove it out to Joshua Tree. There's a place there called Cap Rock, and it's because a rock with another rock on it that looks like it's wearing a cap. Mm. And uh, there's an overhang there, put a coffin and all under there, splashed in a couple of gallons of gas, threw a match in, and uh, released Graham's body, or his spirit rather, into the, the desert air. And um, for a long time, there were still scorch marks under there, and you could find bits and pieces of uh, the coffin. They supposedly got all the remains out of there, sent those back to Louisiana to be buried in his family plot. But, um, I mean, that's just one of the things that, that happened in Joshua Tree. There are a lot of UFO sightings out there. Uh, sands um, ingestibles. There are people that are stone cold sober that have seen things out there. Um, Bill Melder, uh, the other half of the Missing Persons and Mysteries channel, he got lost in Joshua Tree. He'd gone out there after his mother died just kind of to help him with the grieving process of his stories there in the book. And he encountered these beings that he thought they were some kind of shadow beings. But the more I think about it and, and the way I took the account, it seems to me like they were almost like alien greys or something. Um, he would, would lay down to rest at night and these creatures would come up from, from different angles and like look at him. And if he opened his eyes, they would, they would skitter away and back away. But he said they were humanoid. And uh, he, he was in there for five days. He literally thought he was going to die. He had found a, a place where he kind of wallowed out a little hole underneath the edge of a rock and thought, you know, this is it. This I'm literally digging my own grave here. Yeah. And then uh, woke up with a park ranger um, forcing water down his throat and uh, said to him, buddy, there's a lot of people looking for you. <laughs> so. um, and and he, was he off the main trail or he just – Get like Fayled there. I, I think he was just wandering around, and that's something that happens a lot, especially people that go off trail. If it's even if it's in an area they're used to, I've gotten turned around in the Smokies before off trail, and just luckily knew where certain things were and certain landmarks. And I'm old school. If I don't have a GPS, I can use a, a compass, particularly an orienteering compass, or if a there's not a huge tree canopy and I can see the, the stars. I can navigate by the stars to a degree. But uh, nowadays, you know, people have their GPS. They go off in the woods. If the GPS dies, then what do you do? Yeah. If, if you can't read a, a topo map or a, or a compass or anything. So, but um, some of the most fascinating disappearances are those where people talk about they're on the trail and then suddenly they're not. Yeah. And they maybe turn around 180 degrees and look. And they haven't been on a trail for a while, apparently, even though they thought they were. And uh, just almost like a, a time slip or a, a glitch in the matrix, if you will, where suddenly you're somewhere else other than where you thought you were. There's no recognizable trail, no markers. You don't recognize any landmarks or anything. Been a lot of stories of people that have become lost under those circumstances and then eventually found their way out. And some of them would be just something simple like, well, I just kept walking. And then eventually I came back from like the other direction than I was going in. I stayed on the same course, but then came in another way. So there, there's something out there. I don't know if it's portals or I mean, it depends on how esoteric you want to get with it, but there's something that happens in the woods that that uh, it does something to your mind, yeah, or your sense of direction, or something. I don't know. It could it could be, you know, natural explanation. I've heard people say, well, there are plants in out there that are mildly hallucinogenic, or you can, uh, if you're dehydrated, you can imagine things, and I'm sure all that's true, but. Some of it, you know, it just, it doesn't, it sounds like something more. And uh, one of the strangest things I've ever encountered is being deep, deep in the woods and have everything just suddenly go absolutely deathly silent. Oh, yes. That's yeah. very unnerving. And usually, I mean, I can understand it could be, you know, an apex predator or something around. So the birds and everything shut up. But I'm talking about where you can't hear the, the leaves, you can't hear the wind blowing, you can't hear yeah. water can't hear anything it's literally like you've gone deaf or somebody turned the, the giant volume knob all the way down or hit the mute button yep and anytime that's ever happened to me it happened a lot in the smokies mainly because that's where i, I did most of my hiking uh in my younger years there along the appalachian trail but um 
when that would happen, I always thought that that was just some kind of a warning or a, you know, turn around and go the other way or pick a different direction or something that, uh, feel like if I continued on, then, uh, nothing good was going to come of it. Yeah. I, the, the first time I experienced that, I was a kid, I don't know, maybe 10, 11, 12 at most. And, uh, I was in a park on Long Island called uh, South Haven State Park, I think it is. My parents belonged to a like live steam thing there uh, for mm-hmm. train, you know, like miniature trains. Yeah. And I would ride my bike around the park, and I came to this this section of the park I hadn't been in before, and it was just this big open field with some packs of trees in, in spots. And that I, I had that, that ominous feeling. Everything went dead quiet the first time I experienced it. And I'm like, I should turn around now. So I don't, you know, like it, it, it just freaked me out to no end. I've had that happen plenty of times since. Now now I have more of a sense of, you know, what's going on. Like I'm, 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 I've, I've had enough experience with it that it doesn't freak me out completely. But it's yep. still an unnerving experience. But that first time as a kid, I was like, oh, my God, I feel like I'm in danger. Yeah. Yeah, there is a, a certain element of that there. You uh, get your attention, feel the, the hairs on the back of your neck rise up or whatever, or almost a fight or flight type thing, a yes. very feral response. Yeah. Something's not right. Yeah. Um, you talk you talk about how many bodies. First of all, Joshua Tree, uh, people, of course, probably know it from the U2 album. Um, but the, the Joshua Tree... Like what specific is it is talk about that tree a little bit, those trees that the park is named after. Yeah, it's a certain type of tree. And uh it's uh the Mormon settlers gave it that name. They felt it looked like uh it's uh, looked like a person raising its hands in supplication or prayer. Hmm. And so they named it after Joshua in the Bible. But uh, the the cool thing about it, or the weird thing about the U two album, uh that uh iconic album cover wasn't shot in joshua tree it was several miles outside the park although there are joshua trees in the picture and the one that's in there it it uh fell down or somebody cut it down something happened to it several years ago and it's still there it's just on the ground Mm. and there's a a homemade uh, stone marker that somebody's carried out there to commemorate the album and uh, people leave a lot of notes and, and YouTube memorabilia and stuff out there, but it's not actually in Joshua Tree Park. I've, I've known people that well, I went to Joshua Tree and I, I couldn't find the U two thing. Well, it's not in Joshua Tree. <laughs> that sounds about right. Yeah. But I mean, that it's the name of the tree, so you know that's fair. Yep. Yeah. Um, but a common mistake. So the uh, and, and where is Joshua Tree exactly in California? It's more Southern California. Uh, it's kind of halfway between Los Angeles and Las Vegas. Okay. If you travel through the desert and take that route. And, uh, that was, I used to go there when I lived, I lived in Vegas for about seven or eight years. And, uh, that was a, a cool place to go on the weekends. It's not real touristy despite, you know, the Joshua tree it used to be Joshua tree national monument. Now it's national park. But uh, there's some some good Mexican restaurants there and these little motor lodges and things like the uh, Joshua Tree Inn that I mentioned where Graham Parsons OD'd. It's like one of these little motor court places, you know, that's like on the old uh, the highway style and Route 66 style, style stuff. And then you're also close to, to Pioneer, California, which is another cute little place there. Uh, a lot of strange folk out there, a lot of aging hippies and new a- new agers and um, people of that ilk. Hmm. Uh, kind of like the same at Mount Shasta. If you get into the, the town of Shasta or in nearby Weed or McLeod, a lot of, uh, lot of new agers up there kind of has a history for that. And there's something about these power spots that I think that attracts those people there. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Um, okay, so you talked about uh, – do you want to talk a little more about Bill's Encounter? Like how that started off? Yeah, he just his his mother had passed away, and he was you know in the grieving process, having a hard time. He and his mom were very close, and uh, he said he just he was almost a compulsion. He kept he was living in California at the time, and he kept thinking, "I need to go to Joshua Tree. I need to go to Joshua Tree," and but he didn't know why, and so he just eventually gave up, went to Joshua Tree, and then uh, ended up getting lost for five days. 
and uh, we've got a video about it on our channel, complete with the news report and everything. Nice. But it's it's a fascinating story, and again, he he felt like he was drawn there, and he still doesn't know why, other than if it was to have that, what he th- describes as a near death experience. I I would think and so. Then, and then not only did that help him through his his grief process, but it. I think a lot of times when you have a brush with death like that, it makes you appreciate life a lot more. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like it was a liminal point in his life and he needed something to kind of make that transition. Yep. And that that's what it was. And uh, as far as I know, he hasn't had any urge to go back to Joshua Tree <laughs> since then. So whatever it was, uh, one and done. You you also talk about how there's tons of bodies buried in this area um, from from all kinds of for all kinds of reasons. And you got to wonder if that has an effect on the energy of the place. I, I think it would have to. I mean, how could it not? Uh, you know, down south, we have a lot of uh, Native American burial mounds and things, and those always have a very peculiar feel to them. So, yeah, it's particularly there in the desert, Joshua Tree in that area. Like I said, it's halfway between L.A. and Vegas. Perfect dumping ground for uh, mob, mafia, that sort of thing which was very, very prevalent in uh, Las Vegas and in Los Angeles, for that matter, back yeah. in the middle part of the, the 20th century. You had your mobsters running the studios, you had your mobsters running Vegas, and you know if you had to go from one place to the other, you stop in Joshua Tree and dump a couple of bodies. And it's like they said in the um, movie Casino, uh, there's a lot of holes in the desert and a lot of problems in those holes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so let's talk about the missing people in this area, like, uh, Bill Iwasco. Yeah. No, they found him recently. I don't, Did they? Okay. I don't think they had when I turned over to his, I think it was him. Might've been Paul Miller there. I know there was one that they found recently. Hmm. Cause this, uh, this guy just wandered, you know, wandered down a trail, which shouldn't have been a problem and kind of just disappeared. Yep. He was another one of those that just almost felt a calling or something to go there. He was from Marietta, Georgia and just decided, you know, I've got to go to, to Joshua tree national park. And, uh, he'd planned a, a solo trip, uh, packed a light lunch and you know, water and snacks and things like that. Uh, supposed to finish his hike and return to his vehicle that afternoon by 5 PM. Never made it. Uh, they, they found his, his car was at the, uh, the parking area on Keysview road, which is there close to the, the trailhead, and then uh, other than a bandana that they thought might have belonged to him, uh, nothing has ever been found. No clothing, no backpack, no bones or any kind of remains or anything like that. And this was somebody that was a, a military vet. He had served in Vietnam and, uh, you know, knew his way around the outdoors. In fact, he'd been to Joshua Trip on other occasions. But uh, prior to the one in uh, 2019, you know, he'd been in fit, good physical shape, had no known medical issues, just loved nature. But again, he felt that draw. And there's certain places like that. I felt that at Mount Shasta. Um, I was there in March. I'd spoken at a UFO conference in San Francisco and I stopped and spent a couple of days in Mount Shasta on the way down. And it, I can't wait to go back. It's just one of those things. I didn't really do anything while I was there. But I noticed I would be like outside doing something, maybe getting something out of the car, and I'd feel like I was being watched. And I would turn around, and there behind me is this imposing mountain. Is stayed right in the edge of it in the a cabin there, and it's like it's like the mountains looking at you. You know, it's like Nietzsche and the, the abyss. You know, you you peer to the mountain, and the mountain appears into you as well. But uh, there's just, I don't know, there's just such a weird energy there. It's that way at Joshua Tree, too. That's another place I'd like to go back to. Uh, can't get back soon enough. Last time I went there was when I lived in Vegas. Um, made several trips there. Uh, I guess it's been about eight, nine years now because I've been out here in Oregon for that long. But uh, on one of my channels, my other channel, 13 Past Midnight, I've talked about getting a bunch of people together, going and just uh, four-walling the uh, Joshua Tree Inn, renting all I guess, 10 or 12 rooms they have there, yeah. rent the whole thing out and throw a big uh, party and storytelling and cookout and, and that sort of thing, which which I'd, I'd still like to do at some point. Because there's, there's certain places that the more you go there, the more you want to go back, I think. 
So it was Bill Owasco who was found. He was found back in February. Yeah. And then uh, they, I think Paul Miller was found. So he was another one, elderly gentleman, uh, just disappeared. He was from uh, Ontario, Canada. He was vacationing mm. in uh, California, Nevada. And uh, just decided he wanted to take a short hike uh, by himself. Took the 49 Palms uh, Oasis Trail. That's an easy hike. And then just, uh, yeah, I do have that updated here in the book. In the 2019, Paul's remains are discovered in Joshua Tree in an area well off trail following analysis of drone footage. And they're still not sure what happened to him, why he ended up in the area where he was. Uh, he, he was another one of these seasoned hikers, you know, they kind of knew his way around. And like I said, that's that it tends to be that way more often than not. If it is something that's taking people or or getting people, there's a certain profile almost that fits. Uh, people on the autism scale tend to mm -hmm. go missing on the, the little one end of that. And then people that are very, very intelligent, like PhD levels, they tend to go missing. Um, people of Germanic heritage tend to go missing more than, than other people. Um, people wearing red. And you'd think that would be just the opposite. You'd think if somebody was wearing red, they'd be easy to spot. Right and couldn't go right. missing as easily, but uh, people going red. Uh, we spoke of the the berry bushes earlier. Uh, people picking berries or people near berry patch. Yeah, uh, have gone missing. Uh, water almost always plays in whether they fell in the water or not. Um, also, boulder fields. There's something about boulder fields that. Uh, yeah, and that's that's where a lot of uh, little little people are associated with yeah. the boulder fields around the world. Yeah, and uh, the Algonquins in New England, they've got a. A story about a, a monster that looks like a boulder, oh, yeah. and uh, and can open up and swallow people, and then after it gets uh, the, the soul force or the sustenance or whatever it gets out of them, it spits them out. Well, I've heard stories of people found in boulder fields that look like they've fallen from a great height when there's no height for them to have fallen from. Right. But if you think about that, if something that looked like a boulder opened you up, swallowed you processed you and then spit you back out, you might look like you'd fallen from a considerable height. Um, so this article about Bill says, uh, as it was pointed out by another long-term searcher on Reddit, there are a couple of real mysteries to all this. First, it does appear that both search and rescue teams as well as Tom's own searches came agonizingly cro close to finding Bill, maybe within a football field or two. That should show you how difficult it would be to really spot someone in high desert canyons even when close, a person probably wearing neutral toned hiking clothes would blend perfectly into the landscape. You would have mm -hmm. to basically walk right up to him to spot him. And it appears to be what happened in this case. The second part of this is that sadly, it appears that Bill almost made his way out. He appears to have gotten really close to the South section of Joshua tree, the community. He may have been perhaps two miles to safety. The fact that he didn't make it likely means something did happen. And it's unclear if we will ever know what that was. Yeah, and, and he's not sure what that happened. And uh, he said that after these things started bothering him, that uh, he heard people calling for him, but he never saw anybody. And he thought it was these, he called them shadow creatures in his account there. He thought it was them, like, tormenting him. That, oh, yeah. That it wasn't people looking for him. It was these things calling out his name. And uh, I don't know if it's in there or not, but I, I think I remember him saying that there there was one voice he heard that was either, it sounded like his mother or his sister, which neither one were, I mean, his mother had already passed away. His sister was elsewhere. Now and, the, you know, that's something else that happens in some of these cases. People will hear what sounds like a wife or a parent or a girlfriend calling out to them when that person is not there. And a lot of times the voice will come out of a cave. Yeah. And then now we're talking about your co-writer, co uh, Bill. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's the uh, the other half of the channel. He actually started the channel and then brought me on, and then the rest is history. We just passed 194,000 subscribers this nice. morning. Nice. That's awesome. Um, yeah, so I don't. there's not really a lot of other info on Bill Owasco, unfortunately. So we don't know what happened to him or why he... Yeah, you know. other than he... You know, just didn't make it that time. Yeah. Even though he'd been there and, and said it was a, a and I said he was a little elderly, but there are people in their seventies and eighties that through hiked the Appalachian Trail. So I don't don't consider that 
necessarily an excuse for something happening to you. I mean, granted, I think the older you are, the more likely you are to have some sort of medical emergency out there. Sure. But uh, there was no evidence of it or anything that he had. Uh, unless he, you know, maybe got heat stroke or some sort of sudden onset dementia that caused him to wander way off into an area where he wouldn't normally go. Right, right. But he was, he was what, 69 or so, I think? Yeah, something like that. Uh, late 60s, early 70s. Yeah. But you know, I've thought about that. It's like, you know, people talk about the elephant graveyard, that the elephants supposedly go somewhere to die. Uh, Cherokee tribes talk about uh, how sometimes their elders, when they know their time's getting close, they'll start singing their death song, and they want to go out somewhere. I've had dogs that would do that. I had an old dog when yeah. I was a kid that it had since before I was born. She lived to be about 16, 17 years old. Uh, she wandered off into the woods and died. So you wonder, you know, does that maybe happen sometimes to humans? Like, did he know something that he didn't let on? Did he think, you know, well, my time's coming up. I would love Joshua Tree. I'm going to go out there and... Uh, like I'm going on vacation, then I'm going to go hike out in the woods and uh, prepare to meet my maker. Yeah, maybe. So you never know. I mean, there's all kinds of suppositions and, and things that you can make with it. It's Stuff like that's what keeps me awake at night, sir. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so one of the other missing cases there was of uh, Laura Bradbury, and she has not been found. Yeah, that's a, one of the, the – there's more that haven't been found than have been found. Let me flip over here. Uh, three and a half year old little girl. Yeah. On a camping trip with her family at Indian Cove Campground. Uh, parents were regular visitors to the park and a family of five. Uh, they've um, basically had cramped living conditions at home, like to get out in the wilderness. Um, her and her uh, older brother, Travis, who was eight, had gone to the portable restrooms there at the campground. And uh, she stayed outside where her little brother went in to do his business. And then when he came out, she was gone. So, and again, you know, no sign of her, uh, despite, you know, canvas the area. Uh, they, they called the search off after three days, which I thought was kind of weird. Usually they'll give it at least a week or 10 days or something there. Right. But uh, they, I think. Even though they've never come out and said so much, I think that's uh, that the the authorities feel that that was a an abduction, a stranger abduction. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, unfortunately, uh, and they they offered a skull up at some point, um, and the skull ended up not being definitively hers, and they they were trying to say that it was. Yeah, and uh, the, the there's some weirdness going on with that too, the skull that they showed a picture of to the family and said it was hers. And then the actual skull were different, different sizes. Yeah. In, in 86, it was about two years after she disappeared. They found a skull close to the park's West interest, which was a, a couple of miles or so from where the family had been camping. And, uh, but the DNA test were, it was inconclusive. And, um, and this part kind of befuddled me too. So that uh, they couldn't even tell and uh, identify the blood type or gender. Now, again, this was in '86. Uh, I'd like to see them uh, do some newer DNA. They they tested it again in '90, and um, this time they they said there was a 99 percent likelihood that it was her. But then uh, her uh, father has tried to have the skull transferred from the coroner's facility to a mortuary. So if it is her, they can put her to rest. But uh, because the San Bernardino County Coroner's Office hasn't issued a death certificate, he can't claim the remains. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, yeah, in 2010 interview, he said he was shown about 40 color, 35 millimeter slides of the skull and was astonished to find out it was a full-size skull, like a, a human an adult skull. Yeah. About seven by five inches, missing teeth and lower jaw. And uh, he claimed that the investigators had shown him a completely different skull after the hikers had discovered the remains, a smaller three-inch skull cap. So uh, something weird going on there. I don't know if it's incompetence or cover-up. or Yeah. That's sometimes, and I don't want to throw shade at anybody, but sometimes it almost seems like the either law enforcement, the National Park Service, or some of the powers that be are complicit in like wanting to keep some of this stuff quiet or wanting to say, oh, he fell in the river and drowned or, oh, she ran away from home or something when they, I think, know better. 
And, and, and you can never underestimate incompetence on top of that. <laughs> yeah. So we, we hear that a lot where uh, some of the cases we cover, particularly with the uh, missing teenagers, that uh, the cops don't even bother looking at first because they think, oh, you know, it's a teenager. She ran away. She'll be back. Yeah. Even if it's a kid that doesn't have a history of running away or anything. I mean, kids do run away. That happens, and the majority of them come back. But not every kid that goes missing is a runaway. I think that's just less of a workload for them and uh, really a disservice and uh, disrespectful, I think, to the families of the missing when they they know. You know, the, the kid left home, didn't take any money, didn't take maybe their glasses or their phone or something. You know, somebody that's going to run away will... I would think take, you know, at least a, a hobo bag on a stick, you know, with them. And uh, if not a backpack full of stuff, I, I would have. So, yeah. Yeah. In fact, I, I did run away one time when I was like eight or nine. I went and sat up in the woods on the far end of our property and a storm brewed up. And I, I went uh, back home and told my mom I decided to come back and give her another chance. <laughs> <laughs> did she know you had run away? No, she didn't even know. So we lived, we had like 25 acres out in the country and I played the woods all the time. Only five of that was cleared off. The rest of it was old growth timber. Mm. So yeah, I, I wandered around in the woods for hours sometimes and never even leave our place. So no, she didn't, didn't know that I'd ran away. <laughs> I think I'd left a note or something, but she hadn't found the note yet. <laughs> wow. Um, so you had a personal experience at Joshua Tree. Yeah, that, that was very interesting, too. I'd, I'd uh, booked uh, Graham Parsons' death room on purpose, and uh, it's, it does have a creepy vibe to it. There's there's a couple things in the room that were in there when he passed away, and it, one of them in particular is a mirror. There's a big ornate mirror there, and I've always been kind of creeped out by mirrors anyway. I've heard of people seeing stuff in mirrors and uh, oh, yeah. heard stories of people going in through going through the mirror and you know kind of alice through the looking glass type thing so i booked that room and just wanted to go and kind of hang out and uh the room is full of uh graham parsons memorabilia those that, that don't know who he is he was really the originator of country rock although he caused called it cosmic american music but uh he was with the flying burrito brothers and he and Amy Lou Harris did some uh, solo work. He did some things with the Rolling Stones. He was kind of popular in certain circles, but he was a musician. Um, he uh, OD'd on uh, morphine uh, there in room eight at the, the Joshua Tree Inn. And it was one of those things where they, they tried to wake him up. They gave him an ice cube enema, which yeah. sounds unpleasant. But I figure if that, if that doesn't wake you up, you probably... Not gonna be right. <laughs> not gonna be waking up, but um, when that didn't work, they decided they were gonna go get him some coffee at a little place down the road, which I think if they'd kept him up and kept him walking around, he might have made it. But when they let him lay down, that was it. He went to sleep and uh, stopped breathing. Never woke up. Of course, if they had also uh, called an ambulance, it might have helped. Yeah, that's of course it would have taken a while. Probably uh, there, there might have been one closer than L.A., but it's it's pretty remote. Mm. Um, but uh, anyway, he, he famously died there, and I wanted to stay in that room. I've stayed in it a couple of times, but there's just – so there's all this memorabilia, ticket stubs and posters. Uh, they've got a, a boom box in there and a big uh, stack of uh, burned music from – him and all of his other bands and stuff that he's been in. So just kind of chilling out and uh, – I heard something at the door, you know, and I was like, oh, and it turned out it was a cat. There's a cat that wanders around there and, and let the, the cat in. And then closer to midnight, I heard a very distinctive knock, and I was just kind of halfway asleep. I was listening to uh, this hot burrito number two of, the, of uh, Flying Burrito Brothers, and um, I sat straight up, and uh, Graham, is that you this time? And then I hear the very distinctive knock again. Went and opened the door, and there's these two girls there, probably late teens, early 20s, and head to toe, dressed in black, totally gothic. And uh, they wanted to uh, to buy the room from me. Like, we, we really want to come in this room and do like a seance, and you know we'll pay you whatever you paid to rent it. And I'm like, well, I really want to stay here, but I tell you what, if I can observe, you can come in and have your seance. Yeah. 
That sounds like a good deal to me. Yeah. So uh, they came in. They had a, a big uh, tote full of stuff, like one of these Rubbermaid totes. They had candles and a Ouija board and um, all kinds of witchy stuff. And uh, they had some some modern ghost hunting equipment, too. They had a, a ghost meter and uh, a recorder to do in the, the uh, spirit box. Thing. Oh, yeah, spirit yeah. Box, uh, and uh, so they, they did the thing with the Ouija board. And... Uh, they got something that they thought they wanted it to be, Graham. I don't know whether it actually was or not. But the strangest part of that, when they were doing the, the spirit box section, I heard a very distinctive young man's voice that said cold. If you think about that, they, they put him in the shower. That didn't wake him up, giving him a cold shower. Then they gave him an ice cube enema. So cold was probably the last thing that went through his mind when he mm -hmm. did pass there. And that was, that was kind of creepy. Other than that, it was eventful, but it was, it was interesting. And that was the, the whole point of that trip, you know, just to have a spooky good time there. And I would think with so many people focused on his death that you're, you're, it's going to create an atmosphere. Yeah. So. Yeah, it does. There's right outside the room, uh, Right outside the door and then the dirt there on the edge of the sidewalk, they build a memorial to him. People leave stuff, leave trinkets and, and pictures. And uh, I've seen full guitars left out there before. So wow. it's his spirit is definitely there. And I think it's in the mirror. <laughs> it's also a chair there that was, was in the room when he passed away. But just something about that mirror gives me the creeps. Huh. All right. So the last part of your book is Mount Shasta. And Shasta is located where? Well, that's in Northern California. It's, um, I'm trying to think of what it's close to. Uh, not too far over the, the Oregon border, going south along the I-5 there. Um, and uh, it seems like I was going from uh, Portland to San Francisco, and then I think, I think uh, Mount Shasta was... Probably two thirds of the way or something. It's it's not too far after you cross the Oregon border going south. Uh, so Northern California, uh, beautiful place. When you're you're coming down the five, there's this one bend in the interstate there. When you go around the interstate, then just suddenly there Shasta is in the background, and um, it's just it's very impressive. There's snow on it almost year round. I think uh, maybe it's last year that. Uh, for the first time in ages, there was a, a period there where there wasn't any snow on top mm. of it, but uh, it was back. I was there at the end of March, and uh, there was still snow up on the mountain and then in the shady places in the woods uh, down along the, the edge of the mountain. And uh, pretty cool, stayed at a cabin up there, a lodge, and uh, the morning when I got up to go outside and have a cigarette, let Mulder, my dog, take a whiz. There were uh, bear tracks in the snow on the sidewalk in front of the cabin. So, mm. <laughs> so I'm glad I didn't go out there wandering around at night. But it's just <laughs> it's one of those places. It's a little bit of everything. Like I said, there's there's a lot of new age uh, bookstores and crystal shops and things like that there. Um, they see a lot of UFOs there. Uh, Ascended Masters, supposedly Saint Germain has uh, been spotted there and has imbued his knowledge to people that have started churches and stuff. You can look into, I can't remember the gentleman's name, but he started a movement called the I Am movement back in, it was like the 20s or 30s. Yeah. And actually had uh, a church, a worldwide church of 2 million followers at one time, but uh, kind of had a falling off when he passed away after claiming to be immortal. And, uh, that, that yeah, that kind it. of throws a wrench into things. <laughs> but uh, he supposedly met uh, St. Germain on the, the slope up there. St. Germain offered him uh, a milky substance to drink, which he called uh, the Elixir of the Universe, I think it was. I've got the name there in the book. And some sort of brown cake. And the guy, when he ate and drank this stuff that was offered to him, then he suddenly had all this knowledge. Uh, St. Germain revealed who he really was. And otherwise, it was just a young, blonde-haired guy with a golden glow about him. The guy brought his wife, and uh, she experienced all this, too. And then that was when they started the church. Uh, even the, the Native Americans have stories there. There's a lot of uh, lava tubes. 
in yeah. caves there. There's uh, stories of the Lemurians, which were similar to the Atlanteans that uh, left a, a sinking continent called Lemuria. I don't know how they got inland to California, but <laughs> that's one of the mysteries, maybe through the lava tubes. Uh, there's supposed to be a city of gold inside the mountain. Um, of course. There's also a, a land somewhere inside the mountain where the sun always shines and everything is green. There's lots and lots of stories like that. And a lot of that goes back to the Native American legends and uh, the great spirit came down. And, and Shasta is a, a dormant volcano. And so they, the, the National Geologic Survey considers it active, even though the last time it erupted was like, I think in the 17 or 1800s. But yeah. it's one of those that could at any time, should it choose to. Um, the famous uh, robot granny story, if you've ever heard that, where the little kid was missing. And uh, yeah, you know, I definitely want you to talk about that one. I know uh, that was I learned about that one in one of uh, the missing four one one books. Yeah, yeah, little kid uh, went missing Mount Shasta camping with his family, uh, lost in the woods, and he was just like hanging out. Suddenly, he saw what he thought was his grandmother, and she's like, you know, come on, come with me. So she goes, he goes with her, but instead of going back to the campsite, she takes him to a cave up on the mountain. And in this cave, he said there was all this weird stuff in there. Uh, there were people like in suspended animation. There was old dusty uh, articles in there, backpacks and swords and guns and things. And then at, at one point, she tried to get him to defecate on a piece of paper. Yeah, which is just bizarre. And he wouldn't do it. And then he realized, you know, this, this isn't my grandma. This is just somebody that looks like my grandma. And, uh, she got angry with him and said, okay, well, you're not cooperating. I'm going to take you back. So she took him out somewhere along the trail and just set him down and said, wait here. Somebody will find you. Sure enough, a few hours later, and they'd already searched the area. That happens in a lot of cases, too. People will show up either living or deceased in an area that's been searched sometimes multiple times and very close to where they went missing, almost as if something left them there to sort of taunt uh, the searchers. But, um, so he's sitting there, his parents find him, you know, they're overjoyed, have him back. Well, a few weeks later, he's just sitting around the house. He's, he was young. He's, I think he was like three, four, maybe five years old. Said to his mom, he said, uh, or no, he's talking to his, his other Grand grandma. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> Sorry, I get it mixed up here. And he said, I, I don't like the other grandma. And she thought he meant his maternal grandma. And he said, oh, or she said, what's wrong with her? And he said, no, not that one. Uh, the other grandma, the one that looks like you, that wasn't you, the robot grandma, and then told her the story. He would told the parents, too, and uh, they claimed that he hadn't been watching any science fiction or didn't have any concept of any of this stuff for him to, to make it up. Mm, and, uh, right, right. The, the chilling thing was the, the grandmother, the one that has the robot version, she had gone camping up there several months previously with a friend, and uh, they'd had some kind of encounter where... The only thing she remembered was seeing red eyes outside the tent and then the next morning waking up face down in the dirt and she had a puncture wound on the back of her neck. So that almost sounds like something took DNA or spinal fluid or something and made this clone. It wasn't a robot, but a clone out of grandma and it's still running around in a cave up there on Mount Shasta. Yeah. Or the kid had a very weird... Uh... <laughs> psychedelic like experience after yeah. you know being in the the right place on mike mount shasta yeah indeed uh but uh if, if we just made it up he needs to write books uh, <laughs> science fiction but um yeah it's just it's weird bigfoot lots of bigfoot sightings there uh two of the most unusual bigfoot sightings I ever heard of were there was a lady it's like in i want to say like 1967 saw a female Bigfoot giving birth on a slope in the, on the mountain there. And then the next year, another lady in the same area saw a female Bigfoot nursing a baby Bigfoot. So if you think about it, one lady saw it being born. The next lady seems to have encountered the same mother and child a year later and was being breastfed. Yeah. Interesting. The Lumeria stuff always fascinates me because – uh, as you point out in the book, Lemuria was actually a scientific uh, idea to explain how lemurs were both on what Madagascar and yeah, and India, wasn't it? I think so. 
And so they they postulated instead of you know uh, stuff the 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 continents moving, they said, well maybe there was a, a piece of land there that was that would that got submerged and that was Lemuria, but that's been taken up with like Mu and these other uh, continents that are are either believed to be around the same time as Atlantis or predate Atlantis. Yeah. So it's but when it when it comes to you know coming into California, I mean, California was a lot more underwater during the last ice age. If I'm not mistaken, there was like, there were like rivers and stuff that ran through a lot of the area there. Yeah, absolutely. And that, and that's why a lot of that stuff in a, a backhanded way kind of makes a lot of sense. If yeah. you believe continental drift theory and, and things like that, that's it's interesting. It's fun to think about anyway. And there was massive flooding across that area during the, the end of the last ice age as well, which maybe that's where it came from. Maybe that's where all the, the, the rivers and, and stuff came from and eventually dried out, leaving what we have now. Yeah. I don't yeah, you can look at a lot of those places and tell in the rock where there's been a water level there at one time in what's desert now. Yeah. So, I mean, it's entirely possible if there was a lost continent in the Pacific which is certainly possible. There was certainly land lost in the Pacific, if nothing else. You know, places like Easter Island were much bigger. Uh -huh. um, you know, who knows what else was out there that we're not aware of because it's changed in the last 10,000 right. years. Um, so there could have been a, a civilization that that decided Mount Shasta was the place they wanted to go. Yeah, and it's uh, just iconic you know, that the, the Russian settlers that, that arrived on the uh, along the coast, they could see it from the coast. And... Uh, there's there's some debate over what it, the original word was Shasta or Shastika Shastol, but it, it supposedly means like big and white, and uh, the uh, early Russian settlers in the Russian River area that part of Northern California could see it, and then made their way up there. So it's, you know, I said it's a beautiful country. It's it's strange. It's got an, an eerie feeling, particularly in parts of it, but it's one of those places I can't wait to go back. I've already planned on my next trip. Nice. And I don't think you talked about a personal experience in the book. You said you had a personal experience there? Um, just the, the stuff I'm talking about there where you, you feel the weird oh, things okay. and okay. things feel off and don't feel right. Um, didn't have anything really odd or supernatural happen other than feeling like I was being watched turn around only to see the mountain. But um, I did make some good contacts up there. I've got a, a friend, uh, Bravehorn. He's probably listening to this. He's a Modoc Indian. Hmm. And uh, he's uh, arranging for me to meet some people that have firsthand Bigfoot and UFO stories that have lived there in Shasta, some of them all their lives. And these are some older people that uh, he knows from the American Legion, some uh, veterans and things. So I'm really looking forward to going back and talking to these people. And uh, he's he's seen Bigfoot on a couple of occasions. He's seen a lot of UFOs and things. Yeah, and you also you also mentioned it's, it's one of those places like Marfa, Texas, or the Brown Mountain Lights, where there, there's regular sightings of orbs of light around it. Yeah, I did see lights up on the mountain uh, about two o'clock in the morning. I'd gone out to smoke a cigarette, and I was just standing there looking up on the mountain, and I could see what looked like almost like lightning flashes or you know flash bulbs. But it was way up on the mountain, and there was no clouds or anything around the mountain at that time. So I don't know what that was. Saw it in a couple of different areas, but looking at it on a map where I saw the areas, those areas would have been miles apart. They weren't close to each other. Hmm. Although, you know, you're standing down here, looking up there, it looked kind of close together. Right, but, um, right. You Our know, they have some really unusual cloud formations out there, too, lenticular clouds. You can Google those. There's just some amazing stuff that just normal sky phenomena yeah yeah the uh it's interesting how some of that stuff you know appears over certain places like the lightning strikes we were talking about earlier or just uh -huh. all the all the weirdness around mount shasta for whatever reason like this one place you know not it's not any of the other mountains around it it's just this mountain yeah and i've been to a lot of different mountains you know and just not every place feels the same obviously but some places just feel special. Like I said, the superstitions feel differently. Uh, they feel very much like uh, Mount Shasta does. There's uh, certain parts of the Smokies that feel that way up on uh, Clingman's Dome, the highest point in the Smokies. It's got a very peculiar feel. But it's not always just on the mountains. Like Smokies, Cades Cove, it's down on the ground. Um, 
there in the, the North Shore of Fontana Lake are some of the creepiest and reportedly most haunted areas in the Smokies. And you can feel it. I mean, you can feel palpable change when you go into those areas. Huh. The, uh, I don't know a whole lot about the Superstition Mountains. Yeah, that's uh, something I'll be working on. I don't know if it'll be a book or in a book. So I'm going to try to figure out what uh, states and areas I'm going to do next for that series. It's kind of on hold right now while I finish a couple other things. But uh, I will be delving into the the, the superstitions nice. uh, in a greater degree coming up. Cool. Um, let's see. Do we get through that? My whole, I think we might have gotten through my whole list. Oh, Pluto Cave. That We didn't talk about Pluto Cave. Yeah, that's on uh, Mount Shasta there. It's also known as Pluto's Cave or Pluto Caves. And uh, it's one of those uh, lava tube caves. Has a reputation for all kinds of weird stuff going on. That's uh, supposedly uh, there, there's giants in there or there's people uh, dressed in gold or people that have a, a gold halo around them. Um, there's uh, stories of people that have... Uh, tried to spend the night in there that have gone mad and then there's other people that have apparently stayed with no ill effect huh. the uh also the ufos is, is are people seeing craft or are they just seeing the lights uh they, they've seen both okay hmm. they, they've seen them entering the mountain and coming out of the mountain they've seen them around the mountain um uh, on the ground in you know on the mountain somewhere but literally you see them coming from inside the mountain and then entering and leaving like there's a doorway when there's no door there. Um, it's not uncommon for volcanoes to, to create earth light phenomena. Uh, so it's not, it's not entirely shocking that a, that a semi uh, active volcano might have earth, you know, earth light type yeah, indeed, phenomena uh, around it. Kind of a piezoelectric thing that's given off a charge and, and makes those flashes because, from the ground where I saw it, that's what it looked like was a, a brilliant white flash, like a, a flash bulb, mm. but uh, would have to be one about the size of a basketball to right. throw off as much light as it did. Interesting. Um, all right. So people can find you where? Uh, main channel, Missing Persons and Mysteries. Um, again, the main focus is there is missing persons, but we delve off into little bit of the supernatural and the paranormal and i also have a, an audio only podcast version of that uh apple podcasts and wherever fine podcasts are served um also have a personal channel 13 past midnight on youtube which is just like my sandbox where i just go to play and, and talk about weird things and all the other stuff that doesn't fit with missing persons and mysteries and um i'm, I'm on the web i'm active on facebook uh, Steve Stockton, 81 Twitter handle is strange and odd. I love interacting with people. I love hearing from people. Uh, I love it when people send me stories. One of our most popular segments on missing person and mysteries is actually listener stories where people send in their true encounters of the strange, unusual, weird, and bizarre. Yes. And then, uh, my books are available on Amazon and wherever fine books are sold. Got, um, strange things in the woods. Uh, that's two volumes combined into one. Now it's out in paperback and audiobook. My Strange World, which is my own personal experiences. And then uh, National Park Mysteries and Disappearances, volume one, two, and three. And then I co wrote a book with Cisco Murdoch. It's really her book, but uh, I did some commentary in it. Yeah. We're all children in the wilderness of the afterlife, a haunted, uh, a guided tour through a haunted life. <laughs> I blow that title every time. She likes those <laughs> long titles. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, got a book of ghost stories uh, that I'm co-writing with Jim and Jade coming out. And then uh, Sandy Lewis, my head writer over on uh, Missing Persons and Mysteries. Uh, we're doing uh, Spirited Away about the missing and murdered indigenous. Uh, a look into that. More of a true crime angle than stuff we normally cover. So I'm a busy guy. I'm going to be at some um, conferences. I'm going to be at the... Uh, Dogman Encrypted Conference in Paris, Tennessee on August 13th. be a lot of uh, stellar guests there. Nick Redfern's going to be there. Um, David Weatherly. Uh, he likes it when you call him the black-eyed kid guy, by the way. <laughs> I actually hate that, but everybody, that's what they know. He's like, I've written all these books, and everybody calls me the black-eyed kid guy. That's because he brought uh, it to everyone's attention. Yeah, he did. He really did. Uh, who else? Um Oh, there's a, there's a whole list of people. Go on my um, 
Facebook page. You can find it and see all the people that are going to be there. And uh, then in uh, October, we be going to the Pacific Northwest True Crime Festival in uh, Auburn, Washington, uh, on the college or on the campus of the Green River College, Green River area. There, the famous for the Green River Killer, Gary Ridgeway. Mm, okay, and uh, well, I thank you for uh, spending some time with me, Steve. Oh, it's it's always a privilege, uh, Soraya. Just any time. Thank you. I would like to take a moment here to thank all of my patrons. If it wasn't for you, this show would not exist as it does. And I want to give a special shout out to those of you pledging $10 or more. Leanne Cherry, Allison Cook, Super Inframan, Stephen St. George, CJ, Tim, Andrew Nichols, Matthew Sproul, Bobby Bear, Christine, a blue second gen MR2 drifting around a Japanese mountain, Patricia Gaiaquinta, Alex Whitcomb, American Rambler, Andrew Maines, Barbara Fisher, Beverly Williamson, Big Boy Limina, Charles Davis, Charles in Florida, Land of the Crazy Incommunicable, Chris Ernst, Craig Cicernos, Craig Parmenter, Crystal Ann Compton, Diane B., Duffy Doubter, Edu Camahort, MTK, Eric Citron, Eric Todd, J. Otto Bullet, Joanna Rojas, John Bracken, Carla Mahoney, Kevin, Kevin Shrek, Ron Dupree, Chuck Shutters, Kristen L., Laser Printer Jam, Linz Jackson K., Luke Osborne, MJ Armstrong, Jim and Sophie, Mark Bowley, Mark Brady, Matt in Delaware, Patricia W., Paul Jeffries, Ray Benedetto, Riker and Stark, Roger Gonzalez, Sam Sharon, Stone Wilderness, Tactical Therapist, Taylor Bell, 36 Dingo, Thunderboy, Timothy Castaneda, Tyler Glimstead, Vincent Trewell, Walker, Will Gebhard, William Powell, Ren Collier, Stephen D., and Amber Hall. Thank you all so very much. I hope everyone enjoyed my conversation with Steve, and uh, I'll have him back to talk about book three very soon. There is a Patreon segment where we talk about uh, some of his future work and some of the stuff he's collected there. So yeah, there's a little more to this conversation. All right. Um, again, www.wheredidtheroadgo.com for all your Where Did The Road Go needs. There's merchandise of all kinds with multiple designs from Tim Renner and from the late Jeff Ritzman. Uh, you can also find the entire archive of shows going back to the very first one. There's, I mean, there's a lot of stuff to go through. There's all, all our social media links. Of course, you can become a patron for only $3 a month. And uh, you get extra stuff all month long. And if you want to check out my metal show, which is more than just metal, but if you want to check that out, it's www.thelastexit.org. And I will see you next time. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons, and we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support. <laughs>